last time we were together, Jonah was drowning in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And so we don't have a lot of time. He's running out of oxygen, so we need to, we need to get him up out of there. But let's recap how Jonah got here. Can somebody help me? Let's, let's think through what, what's been going on with Jonah. Claire. There you go. That's a pretty good summary. Why is he running from God? Because he doesn't want to do what God wants him to do. Yeah? What did God tell him to go do? He told him to go to Tarshish and um, go preach. Well, he told him to go preach to Nineveh, and he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Yep, so he ran to Tarshish. You're right. So he's, he's running from God. And so much so, you remember, Jonah essentially says, I would rather die than obey God. That's how serious uh, the situation is. That's how hard Jonah's heart has grown in his disobedience. He would rather die than obey God. And so uh, how did, uh, you may have said this, Claire, and I missed it, but how did, how did Jonah get in the water? Somebody else answered besides Claire. See, I was the one who messed up. <laughs> <laughs> he, got nope. throw, he got thrown in the water. He got thrown yeah. in. Who yeah. threw him in? Why did they throw him in the water? They didn't want. They thought. They blamed him, but but was Jonah over there saying, "Oh, I'm innocent. You you guys shouldn't throw me out." No, he told them to throw him overboard. Jonah knows that he's running from God, and so he would rather fall on his sword. He would rather be thrown in than to just repent and obey God. Well, we talked last time. Uh, we're in that uh, chapter one, and we talked about. Uh, verse 17, it's really a hinge between chapters 1 and 2. You remember we, we talk often that the chapter divisions and the verse divisions are not uh, inspired <laughs> scripture. God didn't tell us chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. He gave us the book. And somewhere along the way, people added chapter divisions and verse divisions, and we're really grateful for that. It makes it a whole lot easier on Sunday morning when I tell you where to turn in your Bible so that you know how to get there. But uh, sometimes we, we're not quite sure where to put those. So in this case, verse 17 of chapter 1, it really stands on its own. You could put it at the end of chapter 1. You could think of it at the beginning of chapter 2. It is its own little hinge post. But there's enough of a pause between verses 16 and 17 uh, that you could really assume that Jonah's dead. You, you start wondering what happened to him because in chapter 1 they throw him overboard. They hurl him into the sea. The sea ceases from its raging. And then verse 16 started focusing on the sailors. It said they began to fear God and they offered a sacrifice and they make vows. And so you start, sort of start paying attention to the sailors and what they're doing. You forget about Jonah. You just kind of assume, oh, he's dead. I mean, they, they all said, we're going to throw him overboard. He's going to die. But then verse 17 comes and it says, And Yahweh, or God, appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. My goodness, a great fish. We know this raises all sorts of questions for us. What are some of the things you wish that you knew about the fish? What kind of fish? Could, how big his stomach was? I think that's a really good question because sometimes we get caught up on the size, but you really need to know the size of his stomach because that's where Jonah was at. It doesn't matter how big he is from stem to stern if he's got a small stomach. So that, that's something we would want to know. How much room has he got in there? Yes. Yeah, so. What did you say, Claire? Like Could have been a shark. Yeah, Andrew, what were you going to say? How did the fish feel about this whole situation? Yeah. Don says it sounds like he had a lot of room. You know, sometimes we start to imagine it like Pinocchio. I don't know when the last time... Yeah, I don't know when the last time you watched the Disney movie Pinocchio. I think it came out about 1940. I haven't watched it since I was small because it terrified me. The idea of this big old whale snorting and swallowing up Geppetto... I, I, I'm still nervous about going to the ocean just because of watching Pinocchio as a kid. But inside, in Pinocchio, Geppetto's in there. He's got plenty of room. He's building a fire. He's got all this stuff going on tight. You know, he's got all this room. He's not tight or compressed in there. But I don't think that's what's going on here uh, in Jonah's situation. We know that sometimes digging into the, 
into the text and then sometimes into the original language can be helpful. Uh, but in this case, it doesn't help us at all because uh, when it says fish in Hebrew, uh, remember they didn't have our modern taxonomy system. So you learned in school all the different ways that we classify animals. And we, we know that we would distinguish between fish and mammals and that sharks would be considered fish and whales would be considered mammals. And we have all these sorts of divisions, but that's not the divisions that the Bible or the Hebrew mind has, has in view there. They would have distinguished a sea creature as opposed to a land creature, as opposed to a creepy crawly creature, as opposed to a flying creature. Those were the divisions. And so uh, when, it, when the Hebrew language just says something about a fish, it's wide open. It could be anything. We're just really not told. Now, sometimes you've probably heard preachers or Bible study teachers give you all these examples from history of, of these stories of where it sounds like somebody got swallowed by a fish. And there's a, a famous one from British history where they say, hey, we, we got this fish and we cut it open and there, there's a man still inside and all these different things. Sometimes they sound really true, but I, I've heard them. I didn't take the time to look them up because uh, at the end of the day, I think that's actually counterproductive. Because what we're doing when we, when we try to do that, we, we know that there's big fish. We know that there are fish or whales that are big enough to have swallowed Jonah. That's, that's not really the issue. But sometimes when we start going down that rabbit trail, it seems like we're trying to find a rational explanation for what's going on here so people don't look at us like we're crazy. But here's the thing. We're not crazy, but we are telling you this is a supernatural event. God's very clear in Jonah that this is actually a supernatural situation. And it's no harder for us to believe that there's a fish that could swallow a human being uh, than it is to believe Genesis 1-1. If we believe Genesis 1-1, we can handle anything else that comes in the Bible. If we believe that there's a God who created the heavens and the earth, then His control over creation, that's not hard to swallow at all. To understand that God could control this fish the same way that he controlled the wind, the same way that he controls all of creation, that's not hard at all. In fact, if we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can certainly believe that God appointed a great fish. Sometimes we get so fixated on the great fish that we begin to miss our great God. And God is certainly at work here. So again, verse 17, it says that God or Yahweh appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Now we'll, we'll see that significance of how the New Testament picks up that language of three days and three nights at a, at a later time. But what I want you to see right now is how the text says that God appointed, Yahweh appointed this great fish. You're going to see that language again in chapter 4. In chapter 4, God appoints a plant to grow up and shade Jonah. God appoints a worm to come and eat the plant. And then God appoints a wind to come during the just two verses there, three verses. Uh, in Jonah 4, verses 6 through 8, God appoints, He appoints, He appoints. And all of those are miracles of creation. So think about it, the plant, the worm, the wind, and now the whale or the fish, whatever you want to refer to it as. All of those are miracles of creation. God is ruling and reigning over creation in all of those instances, and each time he's teaching Jonah a lesson. So we, if you've read Jonah, you know when you get to chapter 4, the whole situation with the plant and the worm and the wind, all of that, God is teaching Jonah something. So I think that's certainly true right here. God uses the same word. He appoints this great fish, and he's there to teach Jonah a lesson through the situation. God appoints this great fish not to devour Jonah, not to have him for supper, but to swallow Jonah. I think that may be a, a, a big miracle that gets overlooked in this process because we know there are fish, uh, there are sea creatures that are big enough to swallow a human being. But the fact that it didn't chomp him into pieces and, and devour him on the way down, that's a pretty big deal too. Uh, we were recently watching some, some videos of amazing things in the ocean, uh, but the, they're, they're terrifying. To, to think that a fish or a whale this big didn't actually take a bite out of Jonah, that's, that's a pretty big, pretty big deal. The fish gulps him down, but it doesn't actually chew him up. Now, again, the text doesn't dwell a whole amount, a lot of time on the, on the fish. Yes, Claire. Hmm. I think Jonah was probably bigger than those tiny fish, though. But think about it. If, if it's a cold blood, if it's a fish, it's cold-blooded. So that means Jonah in the belly of this fish 
he's going to be very uncomfortably cold. And if it's a warm-blooded, if it's a mammal, if it's a whale, it's going to be warm-blooded. It's going to be uncomfortably hot in there. Uh, no matter how big the animal is, the, that doesn't mean the stomach is quite that big. So he's likely in tight quarters. And uh, I'm not an animal scientist by any means, but my understanding would be that pretty much every animal's stomach is designed to crush in and to squeeze the food that it's eating to help dissolve the food. So Jonah is not in a good situation by any stretch of the imagination. Think about the smell of what he's in there. What has this fish been eating? Other fish. It's been eating seafood. So Jonah is surrounded by the smell of rotting seafood. Hey, come on in. You're good, come on in. So yesterday's seafood buffet, that's Jonah's companion as he's in here. And as the fish has been breaking down other animals, the bones are in there, they're poking on Jonah. He has no fresh air, no food or water for three days and three nights. Uh, depending on how deeply this fish goes into the ocean, the, the water pressure is going to get worse and worse. So Jonah, by any stretch of the imagination, is not in a good situation. This is uh, as close to, to death as Jonah ca can experience. Um, we would think of it as a nightmare. Jonah calls it, he basically calls it a living hell there in chapter 2, verse 2. This is a worst case scenario. None of us want to be in this situation except for the fact Jonah is still alive. And that's something we may pass by when we start thinking about, oh my goodness, look how bad Jonah had it while he's here in the belly of this great fish. But he's alive. And he's alive for a reason. We know that God appointed this great fish. That's the only reason that Jonah is still alive. And so Jonah is mercifully saved from death, but probably not the way he expected. That's not the way any of us would really want to, to, to survive uh, an ocean storm. In fact, if it were not for the book of Jonah, I don't think that would cross any of our minds. If we were out in the ocean and the, and the ship begins to sink, none of us would even think about asking God to send a great fish to swallow us if it weren't for the book of Jonah. And so God has mercifully saved Jonah, but not in the way that Jonah wanted to be saved from death. One preacher said that you can pick your means of rebellion, but not your means of salvation. Think about that. You can pick your means of rebellion, but not your way of salvation. Jonah has chosen to rebel. He's running from God. He chose how he was going to do it. He ran down to uh, Joppa, and he got on a boat, and he did all this to run away from God. But God has saved him graciously, mercifully saved him. But Jonah didn't get to pick how God did that. God is sending this great fish, and God has extended mercy to Jonah. But Jonah's unwilling to extend mercy to Nineveh. Jonah said that it was better to die than to go and preach the gospel in Nineveh. But God shows mercy to Jonah, and even though he's unwilling to extend this mercy to the people of Nineveh. So think about it. Has, has Jonah done anything to deserve mercy? Not at all. Have the people of Nineveh done anything to deserve God's mercy? No. Have you and I done anything to deserve God's mercy? Not at all. And so the same grace that God extends to Jonah is the grace that he extends uh, to us, the same grace that he extends to the people of Nineveh. And sometimes uh, God will provide, we know he provides salvation through Christ, and that was not the way anybody expected it. But even in our day-to-day -day lives, God will preserve us sometimes in ways we don't necessarily expect. But the great God has shown great mercy, and he uses this great fish as his instrument of mercy. So how does Jonah respond to all of that? He prays. Finally, he prays. At last, Jonah prays. The captain told him back in uh, chapter 1 to pray, but he didn't pray then. But now Jonah finally, finally prays. We know the Bible tells us we're supposed to pray in all circumstances and that we're supposed to offer all sorts of prayers for all sorts of people. We see that in 1 Timothy. But sometimes we wonder, how can we pray when the reason that we're in this mess is our own fault. Jonah recognizes all of this has happened because it's his fault. He has sinned. He has run from God. And so uh, sometimes we wonder, we, if we're honest, we, we get in that mode where we think, I'm in trouble because I've sinned and I don't want to go tell God that I've sinned. It's kind of like when you're a child and uh, you've disobeyed your parents and you know you've disobeyed your parents, but you don't want to go to them. You don't want to say, you don't want to go confess to your parents that you've sinned against them. 
and they know about it the whole time, and they're just waiting for you to come and repent. Jonah knows that all of this is his fault. And the Bible tells us here that he's praying from the stomach of the fish. Can you imagine that? That's the worst prayer clause that you could ever design, but it's the only one available. And so Jonah prays. If you look there at your Bible, you notice that uh, Jonah 2, most of it, verses 2 through 9, it's this prayer. Uh, it's formatted like a psalm. And uh, you, you may wonder, if not, you'll, you'll think about it now. How did he write it down? Did he have a piece of paper and a pen while he was in the belly of the fish? Well, no, he didn't write it down then. But we know that after this was all over, he wrote it down. And whether he remembered it word for word or whether he summarized it afterwards, Jonah recorded this prayer later on, and we've been given it here in Scripture. But he certainly had nothing else to do while he was in the fish but, but to pray. And Jonah's prayer is very similar to other prayers of thanksgiving that we find in the Bible. Uh, in fact, Jonah's prayer is saturated with the Psalms. So if you have a good study Bible or if it has footnotes in your Bible, it will tell you uh, a lot of the references. Jonah has been saturated with God's Word at a previous time in life. Even now he's running from God, but he hasn't forgotten the things that he knows about God, and his prayer uh, reflects the things he knows about God. So we'll see that here in just a moment. But let, let's read uh, Jonah 2, uh, verses 2 through 9. Let's read and hear his prayer. He said, I called out of my distress to Yahweh, and he answered me. I cried for help from the belly of Sheol. You heard my voice, for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current surrounded me. All your breakers and waves passed over me. So I said, I have been driven away from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to my very soul. The great deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the base of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Yahweh, my God. While my soul was fainting within me, I remembered Yahweh, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their loving kindness. But as for me... I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. That's Jonah's prayer, or at least his summary of it, summary of it that he gives us. And verse 2 seems to serve as an outline of the prayer. Verse 2, Jonah says, I called out of my distress to God, and he answered me. I cried for help from the belly of Sheol. You heard my voice. So if that's the outline, the first half, uh, verses uh, 3 through uh, the middle of verse 6, Jonah is calling out to God, crying out to Yahweh for help. And then from the middle of verse 6 down through verse 9, that's God answering Jonah, and, hearing Jonah and answering him. And so we, we see that outline, we'll, we'll work our way through it. But here in, in verse 2, Jonah begins by saying, I called out of my distress to Yahweh. I called out of my distress to God. The psalmist used this language often. It pops up in the book of Psalms all the time. In fact, some people wonder, um, there's not a lot in Jonah's prayer here that specifically relates to uh, his circumstances. He doesn't talk about God sending him to preach. He doesn't talk about his rebellion. He doesn't talk about getting thrown overboard. There's not a whole lot in the psalm that necessarily is specific to his situation. Even some of the things about the water and all of that, that's as close as it gets, and that could be a metaphor for other stuff. So sometimes people wonder, is this a psalm that Jonah knows that it's not in the book of Psalms? Is this just a different prayer that he has adopted, he's memorized, and he's praying it in this situation? That could certainly be true, but... Uh, even though I think it's probably unique to Jonah, but it reflects what we see all over the Bible. All over the Bible, we see people uh, using this language, I call out of my distress to God. In my agony, in my pain, in my suffering, I called out to God. But what's so interesting is you may remember we've already heard this language of calling out that Jonah hasn't wanted to call out before now. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and call out to Nineveh, to preach to Nineveh, and Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh and call out to them. And when that sea captain woke up Jonah on the boat and said, why don't you call out to your God for heaven's sake? Pray. And Jonah didn't want to call out to God then. But then the sailors on the boat, remember, they called out to God. They were willing to call out to their false gods. And then ultimately they called out to the one true and living God. But now finally, in chapter 2, Jonah finally finds himself uh, 
being as religious as the pagans, and he cries out to God. He begins to pray. Verse 2, it's, uh, he said, I called out of my distress, and he answered me. I cried for help from the belly of Sheol. You heard my voice. Now, Sheol is, is the place of the dead in Hebrew. We talked about that a little bit in Sunday school yesterday as we're going through, uh, through Job. Sometimes it's easy to get tongue-tied and, and get Job and Jonah mixed up. But in the book of Job, uh, they were talking about Sheol. The, that's the Hebrew place of the dead. Uh, we understand more about that because we're on this side of the cross. We're on past the New Testament, and so we understand uh, more about what God speaks about the afterlife. But in the Hebrew mind, uh, Jonah is saying, look, I'm as good as dead. That's where I'm headed. I'm going down to Sheol. I'm a dead man drowning. He says, I called out to God in my distress. Uh, the image is that Jonah, uh, even as he's sinking in this ocean, that he's praying to God. Even as he's drowning, he's now praying to God to save him. But that's where things get hard to understand. It's hard to wrap our minds around Jonah because chapter 1, it seems like Jonah's ready to die. He's willing to die. But now, uh, as he's sinking and he's actually in the process of drowning, he says, wait, maybe not yet, Lord. Would you save me? He's crying out to God to save him. And that, to me, is one of the hardest things about the book of Jonah is that we can't actually see Jonah's heart. There are places along the way that we get hints of what he thinks. We know in chapter 4 uh, that Jonah says, this is the reason why I didn't want to go preach in the first place, because I knew that you would show mercy. And so we get a little bit of insight into what Jonah is thinking. But a lot of the stuff, a lot of the steps along the way, we don't know exactly where Jonah is coming from. Uh, we wonder, is he truly repentant in this moment? He doesn't necessarily use language of repentance. Or is he just crying out to God? Is he using lots of true language about God, but is it still not fully sinking in with him? Uh, again, going back to the book of Job, Job's friends say a lot of true things about God, but they actually misunderstand God. They sometimes misrepresent God. Uh, and so, it, in my mind, it's hard to understand. Is Jonah actually repentant here? Some people think that he is. Others say, well, he's still stuck in his sins, and, uh, and it's actually irony that he's praying this way because he doesn't actually mean what he's praying. But I think the bottom line, at the end of it all, we don't fully know what's going on in Jonah's mind. And that's the scary part because it, gets, it hits close to home because we don't always recognize our own hearts. We don't always see when we look into our, our own hearts, when we look at our brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't know when somebody's truly repentant. Sometimes people say they're repentant and they don't actually mean it. It takes time to see, as, as Jesus says, if they bear fruits of repentance. So I ask you, if you were... Uh, if you had found yourself being hard-hearted and caught in sin, and the Lord graciously draws you to repentance, wouldn't you want that to be clear to everybody? If somebody were discussing your life, wouldn't you want them to say, well, he had this season of sin, but God preserved him and God saved him, and it was clear to everybody that he repented. For Jonah, it's not as clear. You get over to chapter 4, we know he eventually goes to Nineveh, but he still doesn't really want to go. He still doesn't want the people to actually repent and believe the gospel. So I believe it, it's important for us as Christians to try as much as possible to make our repentance well known, uh, to make it clear to all who are involved. Uh, there was a recent incident in American Christianity. Some of you know about, some of others of you don't. But there's a well-known preacher uh, who was released from his church in Dallas because of, uh, I'm trying to think of the exact language, an inappropriate moral relationship. Now, we all have assumptions about what that means, but the truth is it hasn't been said. Nobody at the church hasn't made clear what it is. But this pastor, uh, it was a solid preacher. This isn't from some kooky uh, camp of people that we don't agree with. He was a faithful preacher of God's Word, and yet uh, for the last five years, he's had an ongoing inappropriate relationship with somebody who was not his wife. And the question is still, this was announced several weeks ago, the question is, is he actually repentant? It's not clear right now. He has a very public ministry, so lots of people are interested, and it's not clear yet whether or not he's actually repentant. If we ever find ourselves caught in sin and God graciously draws us to repentance, we want to make that clear to everybody. But for Jonah, right now it's not really clear. Is he just glad that he's not dying and drowning, or is he actually ready to obey God? Well, between verses 2 and 3, Jonah shifts from the third person to the second person. He goes from speaking about God to speaking directly to God. And so we just get to kind of listen in on Jonah's prayer. 
He says in verse 3, For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current surrounded me. All your breakers and waves passed over me. Now, wait a minute. I thought the sailors were the ones who hurled Jonah into the water. But now Jonah says, God, you're the one who did it. You're the one who cast me into the deep. These were your breakers. These were your waves, your billows washing over me. Jonah begins to realize that God has been at work through this whole situation. The book of Jonah really shows us the sovereignty of God, that God is the one who appointed the storm. Uh, he's the one who hurled the, the wind on the sea and then caused the great storm. He's the one who has appointed uh, this fish to come and swallow Jonah. He's the one that appoints the wind and the worm uh, and the plant. God is at work through all of this. And Jonah is beginning to recognize that just a little bit. God, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and your currents surrounded me. All your breakers and waves passed over me. Verse 4, so I said, I have driven away from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. This is another one of those things that Jonah says that I have a hard time understanding because he says, I've been driven away from your sight. But chapter 1 is very clear that Jonah is running from the presence of God. So maybe in some sense he thinks God has driven him out. Or perhaps uh, he, he's not even clear yet on what his true spiritual state is because we know he's been running away from God. He was trying to get as far away from God as possible. But now he says, I will look again towards your holy temple. I'm going to fix my mind on the temple of God. And whether he's thinking about the physical location in Jerusalem at that time, whether he's thinking about the heavenly temple, uh, either way, Jonah is fixing his mind, his attention on God. When it, Before, he just wanted to run from the presence of God. He didn't want to have anything to do with God. So if you're weighing uh, the scales, if you're weighing the fruits of repentance for Jonah, you start trying to see what's on one side of the scale, what's on the other side of the scale. Well, think about this. Before... We know from chapter 1 that Jonah fled from the presence of God and he fled from the word of God. God told him clearly, go to Nineveh. The book begins with the word of God being sent to Jonah. And then Jonah didn't want it. He didn't want the word of God and he fled from the presence of God. But now we look at him. He's drawing back to the presence of God through prayer. He's talking to God when before he wanted to run from God. And this prayer, as I mentioned to you, is actually really saturated with God's word. Jonah has learned the Bible in the past. He's been a prophet of God. We saw in our first time together that uh, back in 1 Kings, it talked about a faithful ministry that Jonah had. There was a time when he really knew the Bible, and it re is reflected here in this uh, prayer. That's why it's important for all of us, whether at a young age or while there's still time, but no matter what our age, we want to saturate ourselves with God's Word. Because when Jonah is put under pressure here, God's word uh, comes out and his, his prayer is saturated with God's word. We know that Jonah, we make the joke, he didn't have room for pen and paper in there. He also didn't have room for a concordance to get out a, a, a Bible glossary, a Bible index, and start trying to write a very beautiful prayer to make it sound very flowery and all that. Everything that Jonah says comes out because he had put God's word into him. And so uh, when we want to consider, is Jonah repentant or not, this is a good sign. He used to flee from the presence of God and from the Word of God, and now he's returning to the presence of God through prayer. He's remembering the Word of God that he's learned in the past. And so if we're trying to think about his, uh, this idea of repentance, we understand that we look at all the Bible. The Bible teaches us that repentant hearts draw near to the Word of God and to the presence of God. So if you're trying to weigh somebody to see uh, if they are truly repentant over their sins, are they drawing near to the Word of God? Are they drawing near to the presence of God through prayer? Uh, when you look throughout the Bible, you look at places like Ezra and Nehemiah that we studied a year or two ago. You look throughout church history. We know that when God sends genuine revival, people want the Word of God and they want to pray to God. When we think about revival, we often think of all sorts of other things, uh, lots of ecstasies that sometimes get uh, added to uh, so-called revival. But the Bible teaches us that revival is always accompanied by prayer and the Word of God. And so generally speaking, when you're evaluating uh, the fruit of other believers, when you find people coming to gather with the saints, when they want to hear the Word taught, when they want to gather for prayer, that's a good sign. 
that's usually a really good thing. So uh, if I could just be more blunt, if you look at the people who come to Bible study on a Monday night, that's usually a really good sign for their spiritual health. But before you pat yourselves on the back too much, remember there was a time when Jonah appeared to have it all together. There was a time when Jonah was serving as a prophet in the king's house, and he seemed uh, to be blessing the people of God. He seemed to have it all together. And while he may have appeared warm on the outside, his heart was drawing and growing cold on the inside. In verse 5, Jonah continues to pray. He says, Water encompassed me to my very soul. The great deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Can you, can you get the image that Jonah is painting for us? Can you feel the pressure of the water pressing in as he's drowning, drowning, going further and further into the ocean? The, his lungs are filling up with the cold salt water. He's picking up seaweeds as he goes. The seaweeds are getting wrapped around his head. He's going further and further. Verse 6, I went down to the base of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Do you remember Jonah's downward trajectory? We talked about that last time. The emphasis on the word down. Jonah keeps going down, down, down. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the boat. He went down below the deck of the boat, and then he laid down. He's as far down as you could get on the boat. Now he's been thrown overboard, and he's going even further down in the ocean. Down, down, down. He even says the bars of life are closing behind him, and he's now entering the place of the dead. But something changes in the middle of verse 6. And we know that God sent this fish. And now Jonah says, You have brought me up. You brought up my life from the pit. O Yahweh, my God. And again, that sounds like something David could have written in many of the Psalms. It sounds like something other biblical writers could have written. It sounds like our testimony. Could not each of us who are in Christ say, God, you brought up my life from the pit, my God. God is gracious to Jonah. He shows him mercy. And so Jonah continues to praise God here. It's interesting. When you look at this prayer, some, some people treat Jonah chapter 2 as if it were a, a, a manual on prayer. We should take Jonah 2 and we should dissect it and we should get all these instructions from prayer. We certainly can learn from Jonah's prayer, but we know that's not all the Bible has to say about prayer. One thing that stands out to me is that Jonah never actually asked for anything in this prayer. He just tells us what God did for him. He praises God for what God did for him, but he never actually makes a petition. He never actually asks God for anything in this prayer. So he says in verse 7, While my soul was fainting within me, I remembered Yahweh, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Again, Jonah keeps mentioning the temple, a temple that... He wouldn't have served in in Jerusalem because he served the northern kingdom. So Jonah didn't go to Jerusalem to serve in the temple on earth. He seems to be thinking about the heavenly temple. The Lord is in his holy temple in heaven. Remember, Jonah tried to forget about God. He tried to run from the presence of God. He rebelled against the word of God, but God graciously pursued Jonah. And Jonah prays to him, My prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Verse 8 and 9, he, he begins to compare himself to somebody. He says, Those who regard worthless idols forsake their loving kindness. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. Well, who exactly is he talking about in verse 8? Those who regard worthless idols forsake their loving kindness. Is he talking about the sailors? I mean, we, we saw that the sailors on the boat, they were all pagans. They didn't know God. They were crying out to all their gods. And eventually they got around to crying out to Jonah's God. But what's interesting, if that's who Jonah has in mind, Jonah doesn't know what happened to them because they threw him overboard. So he doesn't know what happened. But we remember what the, uh, the book tells us, that they made vows and they sacrificed to God. Interesting. They did the same thing that Jonah says he's going to do. Jonah says, as for me, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed, I will pay. The sailors, after their encounter with the one true and living God, they said, hey, we're going to make vows. We're going to make sacrifices once we get off this boat. When we make it back to dry land, we're worshiping this God, the God of Jonah. And now Jonah, as he's praising God, even in the belly of the fish, he's saying, Lord, I will make sacrifices, I will vow to you. He's confident that the Lord is going to preserve his life and there will come a day that he's able 
uh, to make sacrifices and to keep his vows to God. But then he concludes with what I think could be the theme of the whole book. He says, salvation belongs to God. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. Salvation comes from the Lord. And we know that that's absolutely true, but I'm not sure that Jonah really has it figured out yet. He's saying the right thing, but I don't know that he really knows how to apply it to his own ministry. We know that salvation comes from the Lord. That's the who. He's the only one who could save us. He's the only one that could save Jonah as he was drowning and going to death. God is the only one who can save any of us. And God is the one who provides salvation when he chooses. And so God saved Jonah right at the last minute, right before he completely drowns and dies there in the ocean. And God chooses when he wants to save us. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation, uh, if it comes from God, it means that God can save who he wants to save. And Jonah really likes it right now that God has saved him, but he's still not so, so sure about Nineveh. Remember, that's the whole point in the background here is that God told Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel to people that Jonah didn't want to see repent. God, uh, Jonah wanted to see God judge Nineveh. And so Jonah's not very happy about this idea that salvation could come to Nineveh. So now he sings God's praises. He says salvation belongs to Yahweh. But is Jonah really going to apply that to his own ministry? Is he willing to see salvation come to Nineveh? Well, you may already know the answer, but we're going to get to that next time as we go into chapter 3. But verse 10, it says, Then Yahweh spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Even the fish can't stomach Jonah. The fish is ready to be done with Jonah. Andrew had a good, uh, good point. What does the fish think about this whole situation? Because the fish really had no choice in the matter. Neither does the worm, neither does the wind, uh, and neither does the plant that God appointed. All of these things serve at the pleasure of their creator. And the creator speaks, Yahweh speaks to the fish, and it vomits Jonah up onto the dry land. And I can't help but notice that this fish is much more obedient than Jonah. Because God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, and he rebelled. But God tells the fish to spit him up, and the fish does exactly that. It spits him onto dry land. We don't know exactly where, but I think it's a safe assumption that Jonah's right back where he started. He's right there at the dock in Tarshish where he tried to flee from God. Remember we talked about last time, it doesn't seem like they went very far. Uh, the sailors were trying to get back to shore. They haven't made it very far at all. And now this uh, fish, no matter how deep Jonah has gone, it's now brought him back right where he started from. But he's alive. That's the amazing thing. We, we look at the drama of Jonah's life and what happens in the belly of the fish, but he's still alive. But he certainly has been disciplined by God. He's been disciplined in a, in a very extraordinary way. Most of us are not normally disciplined by God in such dramatic ways. I trust none of you have been disciplined in an identical way. If any of you have been swallowed by a fish and you haven't told me about it by now, I'm really going to be upset. Most of us are not disciplined by God in such a dramatic way, but the Bible does tell us that we are also disciplined by God. If we are His children, He will discipline us. We know that the book of Hebrews tells us this. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And then the writer of Hebrews, the preacher of the sermon in the book of Hebrews, he starts quoting the Old Testament where it says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. Jonah probably did not feel very loved while he was there in the whale, in the fish, until he remembered the fact that he was still alive, that God had shown great mercy to him. Often children don't feel loved when they're being disciplined. They, they don't believe that the whole, the whole line about this hurts me more than it hurts you. Children don't believe that. They, they don't understand how you could love them and discipline them. But the Bible is very clear that God disciplines the one he loves. And so if you're under the discipline of God, that ought to actually be a comfort to be reminded that God loves you so much He's not going to let you continue in your sin. And God loved Jonah so much that He wouldn't let him continue in this sinful situation. And the writer of Hebrews goes on and he says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, 
in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. He says if you are not experiencing the discipline of God, you need to question whether or not you're a child of God. That's very uh, foreign to our way of thinking as Christians today. But God says, if I love you, I will discipline you. Besides this, the writer of Hebrews goes on, Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But He disciplines us for our good that we may share His holiness. While it could be debated today, most parents of previous generations understood that it was important to discipline their children. And for the child, it may seem like it's going on forever. You think, oh my goodness, 18 years, however long you live in your parents' home, and you think, I'm under the discipline of my parents. That's really a short time in the grand scheme of life. And it says that fathers discipline their children as it seems best. There's no guarantee that, that human parents, no matter how godly they are, that will get it right every time. But God always gets it right, and He does it for eternal value. It says He disciplines us for our good that we might share His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. I think if we've ever been disciplined by our parents, we can all agree with that. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God's very clear that He disciplines His children for our good to make us holy like Him. And Jonah's going through this season of discipline. One writer said that Jonah deserved death not deliverance. That's certainly true. Jonah has disobeyed. He deserved to die on the spot. But so do we. We all deserve death. We didn't deserve deliverance, but God has shown mercy to us. Jonah recognizes God's grace in his own life, but as we're going to see in chapters 3 and 4, even though he's going to get a second chance, another chance to obey and go preach in Nineveh, the question is, is Jonah really ready to extend this gospel of mercy, the gospel of grace to the people of Nineveh? Is it all going to end happily ever after? If this were Pinocchio, if this were a Disney movie, we'd say, all right, Jonah's made it through the hard part. Now let's get to the good part. Let's get to the conclusion where everything goes like it's supposed to and they all live happily ever after. We all know that that doesn't always go that way in this life. God promises, even there in Hebrews 12, He will continue to discipline us until He brings us home. So let's pray, as Jonah has prayed, uh, that we would recognize uh, God's goodness to us even in these seasons of discipline. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your gracious word, the gracious reminder that you love us. You have provided salvation for us through Christ, even as Christ was in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. We know that we deserve the, the discipline, the chastisement that he received in our place. But by that, by his wounds, he's brought us peace. We praise you for the salvation that comes through Christ, the salvation that comes only from you, our God. Lord, help us to remember that even when you discipline us, that's because you love us and that you're making us holy. You're making us more like you. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to grow in holiness and by your word you would sanctify us and you would make us more like Christ. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have any questions about Jonah chapter 2 before we conclude? We assume so. So it doesn't specifically tell us. A lot of the Old Testament books, it doesn't specifically tell us. And there's no good other candidate than Jonah himself. But of course, a lot of it he's writing in the third person. He certainly is writing it after the fact, after everything has happened. Um, it ends on a, on a strange note. When you get to the end of chapter 4, there's not the happy ending that we're looking for. Um, and, and so it's a bit unusual in that way, but we don't have any other candidate for who wrote it besides Jonah himself. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many questions with that because it, it, just, it just ends at the end of chapter 4. There's no nice wrap-up. It's just God uh, corrects Jonah, and that's it. That's the end of the book. And so we don't know what happens to Jonah. We don't know if he ever got his attitude right. We don't. Well, we know what happens in Nineveh when we get to the book of Nahum, what comes after that. But um, there's just a lot of questions that we have about it. Give Jonah a second chance. I 
I believe you amen, brother. Amen. amen. Absolutely. That's what's so interesting about Jonah. Jonah receives the grace and mercy that he doesn't want to give to anybody else. He doesn't want to see anybody else receive the same grace and mercy that he receives. And sometimes we can be that way. We don't want to admit it. We don't want to say it out loud. But sometimes uh, we're thankful for what God's done for us, but we, we don't take it too kindly when other people start acting like that God has saved them too. And they're, they're not acting the way we think they should act. And in Jonah's case, he didn't want to see that nation over there start to believe God. He wanted them to receive the judgment of God. But God's very gracious towards Jonah. He's been gracious to us. We're going to see he's gracious to Nineveh too. Mm. To be, you know, saved from. Sure. You know, multiple times. Yeah. Not just Jonah, but all of us. Yeah. That's what's amazing to me. Um, if y'all didn't hear him, Jeff said it's just amazing how God puts his finger right where we need correction, right where we need to be reminded of certain things. It's not just that God speaks to the issues that we have in our lives, but God applies them to our life in his timing in a way that we could not have planned. So there's times in preaching. I generally plan out my preaching pretty far. And I, like I know what I'm going to be preaching, generally speaking. I'm going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. But there's times when on that particular week, the text applies to my life, to the life of the church in ways that I could not have planned that out. Sometimes people um, kind of um, bristle against preaching through books of the Bible because they think, well, you've got to be free to let the Spirit do. I mean, what if something comes up at the last minute and basically they're giving a defense of flying by the seat of your pants and not, not choosing a sermon text until the night before you preach? But so often God actually works through that normal, ordinary planning, a text that you may have planned to preach months ago. But when that week comes, it applies to the life of the church and to the life of the preacher in ways that you just couldn't have planned that out. To me, that's a greater testimony of God's work through all of that than, than what sometimes we say, oh, the Spirit does this. The Spirit really does work through His Word. Yes, Clara. What if you're a preacher and you're a Christian and everything, but you're still worrying about what you're preaching? Oh, that happens every week. Absolutely. I'm still, I got questions for this Sunday, and I got till Sunday to, to, to figure out some of it. Somebody asked a man one time, how long does it take you to prepare a sermon? And he said, oh, about 62 years. Everything in his life had been building up to that. And I, I see that in my own life. I know more now than I did when I started. And every, every week that goes by, I think I've been preparing for this sermon my entire life. 